I hope I am clearly audible and visible, Jiansh. Am I audible, Jiansh? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, Jiansh Indoorya, I am talking to you. I hope I am audible. Fine then. You may begin the recording at seven o'clock p.m. exactly. I hope that's fine. Good to go. I would like to request all the participants and my fellow speakers to kindly switch on your webcams. We shall be going live in one minute exactly. Please. Webcam on, everyone. Vaishnavi. Kumari Manshi, Rupesh, Mansi Paul, everyone. I hope I'm clearly audible and visible. Still, Anjali? Yes. You have to straighten your screen a bit, Anjali. And I would again like to request all my fellow speakers and attendees to kindly switch on your webcams. I'd also like to inform the participants that anyone without your webcams on shall not be certified at the end of the conference. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm P. Sharun Kumar, the founder of SK Associates and Group, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to Conference 2.6, where we'll explore the topic, Impact of Intellectual Property Laws, the Emergence of Startups. We're honored to have a panel of accomplished CEOs, lawyers, industrial leaders, and senior professionals from Ministry of Corporate Affairs as our guest speakers for this conference. By the end of this conference, we hope you will gain valuable insights into this crucial area. Hello everyone, I'm Anjali Singh, the Chief Strategic Alliance Advisor of SK Associates and Group. It's my pleasure to co-host this conference with Shravan. So, before we dwell into our topic, let me briefly introduce SK Associates and Group. We are an ISO certified, internationally accredited management consulting firm registered under the MSMED Act 2006 with the Government of India. Our mission is to provide consulting services to aspiring student entrepreneurs globally covering areas such as compliance, operation, marketing, research and development, human capital, strategy and operation. Our passion lies in helping you all budding entrepreneurs bring your dreams to life and contribute to global economy. At SK Associates and Group, we take pride in offering tailor-made solutions to our clients. Our team of transformational consultants has a deep-rooted passion for entrepreneurship and they bring extensive experience and expertise to every project. Over the past three years, we have built a network of 5,000 individuals from, from 30 plus countries representing diverse universities, industries, and functions. Our ultimate goal is to assist 600 million student entrepreneurs in India by providing pro bono consulting services across areas such as strategy, operations, human capital, compliance, legal advisory, litigation, R&D, taxation, and marketing. Also plan to invest 502 US dollars in these startups by 2035, creating more than 5,000 employment opportunities for startup experts, advisors, mentors, and resource. Our vision is to contribute to global economic growth by empowering the next generation of entrepreneurs. Collaboration and strategic alliances are key to achieving our mission. We are committed to promoting entrepreneurship development and community impact with a focus on empowering students for global economic growth. Our aim is to partner with over 1,000 plus universities and colleges by 2030, providing guidance and mentorship to students as they embark on their startup journey. We have recently established partnership with institutions like Bombay College of Pharmacy, Moti Babu Institute of Technology, BMS Institute of Technology and Management, and Sanskrit University. 
the enthusiasm and interest we see among students for entrepreneurship is truly inspiring. Now, startups have the potential to address critical social, economic, and geopolitical challenges through innovative business models. By promoting sustainable entrepreneurship, we can drive positive change and create a brighter future. Entrepreneurs not only generate job opportunities, but also stimulate economic growth, offer innovative solutions to consumer needs, and foster collaborations with other businesses. We have witnessed remarkable success stories where entrepreneurs have tackled issues like climate change, waste management, education, and many others. Absolutely. Entrepreneurship is a catalyst for change and innovation. It's a powerful force that can reshape industries, transform lives, and make the world a better place. We are committed to support inter, support student entrepreneurs on their journey, equipping them with the tools, knowledge, and networks they need to succeed. At SK Associates and Group, we are immensely grateful for the dedicated support of our executive management team, including Ms. Anjali Singh, Ms. Shristi Singh, Ms. Feshali Singh, Ms. Aditi Jain, and Ms. Riddhi Bhanushali. Their unwavering commitment has played a pivotal role in our growth and development. Thanks to the dedication, we can make a meaningful impact on the entrepreneurial ecosystem by inspiring, educating, and mentoring young individuals, encouraging them to pursue entrepreneurship instead of a normal corporate camp. Tonight, we've gathered here to explore a fascinating topic, impact of intellectual property laws and the emergence of startups. Before we dive into our discussions, let's take a moment to introduce our esteemed line of guest speakers and tap into the wealth of wisdom they bring to the table. So, our first speaker for today is none other than Ms. Carolina Denise Panzolini, a consultant and professor at UNWIP. She's currently pursuing her PhD in intellectual property at the Autonomous University of Lisbon, the Master's in Intellectual Property from the University of Brasilia, and Specialization in Intellectual Property from the World Intellectual Property Organization, UN, and George Mason University. Carolina is well versed in the world of IT. Her expertise extends to regulatory policies with a specialization from the George Washington. The next speaker is Ms. Beheshte Mekaniki, a committed lawyer from Iran. She has a Master of Science in Intellectual Property Law from Home University, where her thesis was focused on intellectual property rights, intellectual property rights in the Second Life website. She has been actively involved in legal cases as a sole arbitrator at Isfahan Law Court dealing with issues such as construction contracts and medical equipment disputes. Her academic excellence and professional experience make her a well-known figure in the field. Next, we have Mr. Tobey Chikur Nadunavu. He is a Nigerian lawyer who specializes in intellectual property and technology. He is a lead associate at Inclusion Lawyers, a virtual law firm in Nigeria. He is a member of the firm's intellectual property, technology law, and startup practice groups. He is also leading the growth of the firm's exports new media, private equity, and venture capital practices. He has extensive experience providing legal advice to several local and international technology companies in the fintech and blockchain space. Through his work, he has built relationships with entrepreneurs and innovators in the early stage and growth to startups. Last but certainly not the least, we have Dr. Devanshu Srivastak, currently serving as the Assistant Dean and Professor at G.D. Goenka University, Gurukram. With a wide variety of qualifications, including a PhD in intellectual property laws and multiple certifications, Dr. Shivastav is a dedicated academician and a researcher with over a decade of teaching experience. His contributions <coughs> to academia, research, and legal education are both extensive and commendable, making him a notable figure in the field of law and intellectual property. So please join us in extending a warm welcome to all our distinguished speakers on the panel today. Bring valuable insights and expertise that will enrich our discussions for this we are live on YouTube, so once the conference ends, you can access the recordings there for sure. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and do watch all the previous conferences hosted by SK Association. Now, before we commence this conference, I would like to request all of you to kindly switch on your respective webcams. We would also like to inform you all that our HR team will be conducting calls in the chat box throughout the conference and encourage your active participation. Unfortunately, our first speaker, Ms. Carolina, won't be able to join us today as she is suffering from COVID. We send our best wishes for a speedy recovery. <coughs> Moving ahead, I would like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Beheste Mikalanki, to commence her speech. Thank you, Mr. Uh, 
Hello, may I start? Okay, I want to share my screen with you. Would you please help me with this? Sure, you can click on the fourth button from your right, uh, where there's an icon of a square embedded with the upper headed cursor in it. Okay. Yeah. Do you get the option to share your screen or your entire window screen? Um, you mean whiteboarding or not? It's not that. Not visible till now. I think uh, I sent my presentation uh, to one of you. And if it's possible, you can show it. Uh, sure, let me share it from my end. Just a minute. Okay, I find it. All right. Uh, you have my screen? Yes, it's visible now. Okay. Uh, sorry, but I think uh, if you have my voice or my uh, picture, if you send just a message in the box. Pardon, ma'am? Your screen is visible. Uh, you have my voice or not? Uh, we do have your voice. Uh, even when I uh, played the presentation, uh, did you hear my voice? Yeah, sure. We did. Okay. Um, thanks for uh, the introduction that you had. Uh, I'm so happy to be in this atmosphere, even virtually, it's Behishte Mikhaniki. I'm a lawyer from Iran. And uh, if I want to talk about my um, career background, as uh, one of your colleagues said, I'm now um, working or conducting some um, researchers on um, intellectual properties related to virtual worlds and also uh, games and social medias and uh, arbitrary and something like that. But today I'm going to talk about IP related issues, um, which are, I think, main obstacles to startups. If uh, I want to start, I can say, imagine a situation or uh, a company that the inventor and investor, uh, they are the same. And uh, uh, he's trying to uh, make a bright future for himself. Uh, he has a great idea. He put it in an uh, invent without um, any IP matters. And uh, that's it. He, he will be uh, successful without competitors trying to copy his idea or um, his IP assets. This is the problem that most of the entrepreneurs or startup owners can face uh, during um, conducting um, some researches and uh, being successful in their career. I think um, IP is a journey in uh, startup 
for startup owners. And because of this, I just chose a trend for my, my presentation. And uh, there is a map that I want to start with realizing IP creation, IP pitfalls, IP audits. And at the end, we talked about IP awareness and uh, what we should do to be protected by IP. Um, first of all, for the step one, we can say what is IP. IP is one of the biggest challenges for any entrepreneur to realize that he or she has created an IP asset in the course of his a lot of um, startup owners that they know that they have intellectual property, but they don't know what kind of intellectual property they have or they own. Uh, this is really interesting and important question that uh, at the beginning of your career, you should ask yourself, your partners or whoever is working with you. Uh, most common types of IP are trademarks, patents, copyrights, and trade secrets. I know that because of uh, your backgrounds that most of you are interested in intellectual property, you should know. But I just want to say some details, some important details about each of them. Trademarks protect uh, brand, brand names, logos, and other identifying features that distinguish a company's product from others. Patents protect the invention and giving the exclusive right to the owner, maybe for selling the invention or manufacturing it. Copyrights protect original works of authorship. Um, it, you should pay attention to this because this is talking about uh, original works, not the idea behind this. And uh, trade secrets um, can be protected um, by not exact legal circumstances, and uh, there, are, there are some examples such, a, such as secret recipes, uh, methods of production, as we can um, see in Coca-Cola's formula. Um, it, it has been uh, protected by trade secrets. Uh, how we should protect or secure this kind of IP that I told you. The most important thing is that you should register each of them in your patent office, in your country, or even if uh, you have branches in other countries and you're working internationally, you should uh, be careful and just um, protect it as a international laws, under international laws. Uh, and the first step that I think you should do for um, trademarks and patents, and both of them, is that you should do or conduct some researchers. <clears throat> and after that, for patent, you should disclose disclosing uh, your uh, patents before filing it. And for copyright, there is no exact law because some countries uh, like Iran <laughs> protect copyright without registering it and others just protect by registering the right. And uh, our step two is IP pitfalls and consequences. If you are an entrepreneur or you are a startup owner, uh, there are some important things that you should avoid um, using or repeating it during your uh, work. Considering IP as unimportant, it means that some uh, owners mark IP as an unimportant thing, which is really dangerous because when you do this, uh, you are putting yourself in some uh, delaying process. You may um, lose some liabilities or rights. And uh, even by uh, disclosing some information, you hinder yourself from registering the rights. You should be careful about it. Conducting um, sufficient research is important. Don't failure. <laughs> if you're doing research, we have some 
identical and similar prior um, research for trademarks and also prior art research for patents. And they are the first uh, step that um, should have been done before or prior any investment. Not paying attention to the business name. You should pay attention to the business name. It is important. You should have a strong, not descriptive name for your brand, for your company. With this name that uh, can be registered, you can save extra money or uh, extra cost by not rejecting by the IP offices. And uh, you can save the market share, increase your value. It is really important. Be careful. Um, failure to de determine ownership and having agreement in place. When in a company, there, there are more than one owners or inventors, they are collaborating with each other. Uh, it is really important to sign these kind of agreements uh, that IP rights or IP law would remain. Um, and this is a condition for them. For not having uh, legally um, disputes, it's really important and uh, take be uh, aware that by uh, registering, having a powerful trademark name, you are just um, trying to avoid um, legal clashes over trademark, over patent. They are time consuming, they are expensive, they are detrimental for your reputation. And um, step three, which is um, talking about IP audits. Uh, and, um, what is IP audits? It's a systematic review of a company IP assets in order to identify any potential weakness, weaknesses or vulnerabilities in the company's intellectual property portfolios and to ensure that all necessary measures are taken to protect these assets. Uh, we have a lot of reasons um, that we should do IP audits by your legal consultant. First of all, uh, protecting valuable assets. And um, we know that there are um, a lot of threats, possible threats in every company that should be detected by um, IP audit um, consultant, legal lawyer, and uh, take a step to protect your IP. And uh, we know that IP laws is gradually evolving. And uh, it's better to be ensured that IP uh, assets that the company have um, are in compliance with the newest law. So it's um, really good to keep up to date with the changes in uh, IP law. Uh, we have a lot of infringement, as I said before, be careful about them some third parties or some competitors try to ruin your reputation, your um, trademark, they want to copy the asset that you have. Maximizing IP, IP value, uh, I will talk about it with the exit strategy that um, it's a kind of source of revenue and um, you can increase or monetize by doing something. And uh, what is important is that when you take care of uh, intellectual property, investors uh, trust you more than others. Uh, it's a trick that if uh, they know that you're nervous or you're um, careful about your IP assets, uh, like others IP that you have, it means that um, you know how much they would be profitable for you. So they can trust you more than others. Mm. Especially they are, mm. sorry, especially they are uh, signs that differentiate you from your competitors and uh, they can be um, good uh, for recognizing for your consumers and uh, trusting uh, them too. But what is uh, I, um, exit strategy? 
is a strong IP protection strategy that also help companies in their exit strategy. Uh, it means that um, we have a lot of uh, contracts like license agreement, selling invention, franchising, in each of them, you are changing or you are transforming your IP uh, to value, to revenue. It's a source of income for you. Um, it's good to um, consider um, legal consequences besides the uh, market perspectives. In this situation, sometimes you decide that you exit the market by just selling your invention to others and get the most valuable things that you can, you could. And uh, at the end, uh, you should be aware that there are two important phase, or I don't know, maybe, um, what can I call them? <laughs> Uh, whatever, uh, educational programs and non-disclosure agreements are two things that um, most of the times I will say to my uh, clients or my, uh, any of my friends that they are doing startups that uh, they should um, be uh, aware that they have an important role for being successful in the market. What is educational program? Uh, it would be useful for the consumers, employees. It means that uh, you are just informing them that what is IP, how it should be protected, and uh, how we can prevent uh, legal disputes. Um, and uh, be careful that don't use the trademark as much as it can be a generic board like uh, the Xerox, which is a famous example for these things. And uh, non-disclosure agreement is a kind of agreement that can be used to protect a wide range of confidential information, including trade secrets, business, business plans, and the product designs, and more. I uh, suggest this agreement to um, two group of entrepreneurs. The first one who are uh, trying to uh, have contact with out parties like uh, investors, even parties and employees. It is a good way to ensure that your confidential information um, remain safe and a good place. And other group are those who are in a uh, early stage or early phase that they are developing their IP, establishing IP brands, um, it is useful for them. Avoid any leaking information and also avoid exploitation of the IP. So take care. Um, for the conclusion, I can say that transforming IP assets to uh, commercial tradable um, things provide the owner's options to even negotiate over uh, agreements like licenses or licensing or franchising and also uh, prevent even um, uh, disputes and um, the monies that can waste in the, these routes. Uh, thank you. I hope it would be informative for you. And uh, if you have any question, I would be happy if I can answer and uh, this is my email address. Uh, I hope I receive a lot of email from you and answer your questions. Thank you Ms. Mulkanki for the wonderful speech. Uh, we appreciate expertise and knowledge shared today. Do we have any questions for her? You can unmute yourself or write it in the chat box. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, actually, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, as in India, if the startups get patents, patents in terms of intellectual property rights, only for scientific inventions, and there is a different category of trademark and copyrights for artistic like innovations such as 
rare literature books, some collections which could be of historical importance. So are there any similar laws in your country to distinguish what patents should be provided for trademarks and copyrights should be provided? Or are the laws quite different at an international scale? Uh, if um, sorry, I I was uh, reading the question in the box and I thought that it is the same, but it was different. You was talking about uh, patents, and uh, what could be patented in Iran and um, in comparison yeah. with your country? Pardon yeah, me. I'm talking about the categorization of intellectual property rights in terms of patents, trademarks, and copyrights. So are they same at an international scale, or are they? quite a bit different for every nation. Mm, yeah. Mm, as uh, we know, unfortunately, we need, in Iran, uh, we can't protect um, copyright material and, or, or something under copyright material. And uh, for patent and trademark, uh, we are doing the same like uh, international uh, policy. And uh, for trade secrets, mm, I haven't seen any trade secret in Iran until now and uh, most of the times people prefer to have the uh, they write on their patent or trademarks because uh, as you know especially for trademarks we have no uh, limitation or period of time and uh, they can be renewed uh, every for every each period and it's really useful for them and for the patent we just have the 20 years I think in your country, the limited period is 20 years too. I hope I answer you. It was right. Thank you. So, the, You're anyone welcome. else? Any questions for Ms. Beshti? You may simply unmute yourself. So, we have a question from Mr. Ramashankar Tiwar in the chat box. Just please. Mm -hmm. Elaborate about compulsory licensing. Oh, it's like uh, explaining an article. It's a <laughs> wide question, but uh, to be uh, to answer it uh, without any detail, we can say that um, uh, something like uh, pharmaceutical industry which is not my expertise. I'm not an expert in this um, field, but uh, talking about compulsory licensing, um, it, should be, uh, it should be aware that um, parties in a license agreement um, should uh, just accept some uh, litigation between them or some um, conditions between them and uh, they don't have any choice or government is uh, uh, they should be obeying by our government and uh, this is the way that pharmaceutical industry uh, work um, such as i think uh, during the coronavirus i heard that uh, most of the companies that uh, they were producing uh, vaccines they are just using compulsory uh, licensing agreement because uh, there is a force by government and uh, they should do it. Maybe uh, they lose the, the profit that they can have during the ordinary uh, licensing in comparison with compulsory. And I think it is not a good option for them. Any further questions? Yeah, we have a question from Dr. Pankaj Kumar Agarwal, just about Mr. Tiwari's question. Uh -huh, okay. There are moral rights to in copyright. How to differentiate two and four? Okay, what is two and four? Uh, I think that is related to the question uh, which was put. Intellectual property rights protect the use of information and idea that are of. And the options are uh, social value, moral value, commercial value, and ethical value. So option two oh, and four okay. would be so, moral and ethical. Yeah. Yes. In corporate, how to differentiate option two and ethical value. When you're talking about uh, moral value, uh, 
they are really there are a lot of uh, similarities between them but uh, when we are talking about moral value uh, we are just talking the price related to uh, owners or the inventors it's better to say inventors but uh, ethical value relates to something that um, can be related to public or uh, for example when uh, we are um, we have to use a trademark as a generic um, we are uh, taking care about ethical value but in moral value we just um, uh, their aim or uh, our aim or goal is just just the exact person or the exact inventor, uh, not the society. Any further questions? Or shall we move to the next speaker? For today? That's it, Anjali, I guess. Okay. So moving ahead, uh, you have already shared the email address, but uh, please do share it in the chat box again. And if anyone, anyone in our audience has any questions or need further information, please reach out to him. Now, I'd like to invite Mr. Donago to commence his speech. OK, thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, everyone can hear me well, right? All right, thank you. Um, I would. Okay, at the end of the presentation, I would share my screen. I would share my slides. Um, my apologies, because my slides are not 100% complete at the moment, but before the end, end of today, the complete slide will reach um, the organizer. Just a moment, let me share my screen. All right. Uh, um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. All right. Okay, all right. Let me put this in the slideshow. All right, okay. All right, so um, good afternoon from Nigeria. My name is Tobechuku Ndonago. I'm a lawyer from Infusion Lawyers. Infusion Lawyers is, is a technology law firm and intellectual property law firm. So I'm also a member of the firm's intellectual property and technology and startup practice groups. I'm also interested in electronic sports, uh, private equity and venture capital. And I've had experience um, in advising technology companies, fintech and blockchain companies as well, as well as early startup companies as well. So this is a brief outline of what I would like to share with you all today. Um, my, my topic actually is powering Nigeria's creative economy through intellectual property. So by so the state of Nigeria's creative economy, Nigeria's creative uh, economy from our standpoint has, has been growing rapidly. But at the moment, um, the key drivers of that economy have to be the, the movie industry, the fashion industry, and the music industry. But um, of recent, in recent times, there's been an increase in some new and emerging startups that are powering the creative e economy. These sectors are in the um, comics, animation, still in the movies, and also in the gaming industries. Um, and and is this new is this niche area that I would want to also talk about, and how they they leverage IP to bring value to to not not just themselves but the um, economy of the country as well. So um, we will move straight into the, some of the case studies that um, that we've seen so so far right so um we all know um hasbro company the makers of monopoly as well so in in nigeria there's this startup called best man games and they decided that instead of them to start to think about how to 
um, like instead of them start thinking about, okay, what type of social gaming are we going to create and start to re in, reinvent the wheel and start to think about, okay, what new things can we do? You know, there's a very easy adoption of IP, which they decided to leverage, which is licensing. You know, so in this case, they decided to license, um, you know, the, the game Monopoly that we all know to create a more, um, a, a more relatable version in the country that people can relate to, right? So by leveraging um, licensing, they're able to design their own concept of Monopoly where, 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 where by users, you know, in so they have two versions. They have the one of Lagos. Lagos is like the biggest city in Nigeria. And they also have another one that encompasses the whole country. So they, you know, they use different places in the country that everyone knows, you know, within the country to create their own special monopoly that people use, you know, and 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 this game right right, right now is being bought, you know, across the country because people like it and people can relate to it, you know, unlike the one that um, has streets that are in the London, you know, that people find it hard to relate to, you know. So this has been a very good example of leveraging um, IP, you know, in the practical sense. Um, the the second, um, oh, my my apologies, my slides are not. You know, but I will just go ahead to, to discuss the rest. So, so the second aspect that has to do with the animation case study is um, the rise of animation studios. So we have an example of um, the, the, there are some new um, companies that are coming up, some new studios here in Nigeria that are coming up, and they are retelling stories from um, from ancient folklore. So from stories that, that were told and transferred you know, from our an ancestors, right? They are now producing these, you know, and retelling these stories with animation. You know, so these are another way that the stories that would have normally been lost over, over, over time, you know, after, after they've been told years and years, they are now putting it in a more relatable form that, um, you know, that the younger generation can actually see and enjoy. And while they are also creating value. They're also making money from, from these as well. Uh, then regarding the gaming companies as well, this is another um, concept which um, there are new gaming companies that are also coming up. Um, some of these, we've, I, I would still sh I would share my company side at the end. Some of these, they've already started producing games that are still relating to um, stories that within the African context that people can relate to. So these issues of um, comics, animation, and gaming, so they're also addressing issues of um, cultural representation. They're also um, using it to pass across messages to you know, encourage society, and they're also leveraging IP. So now I also get to talk about the IP aspect in terms of how they are leveraging IP. So one, they are creating new characters. So by creating new characters that become licensed, Right, these characters um, over time begin to become popular. And as they become popular, people begin to create assets from these characters. There's also um, adaptation. So maybe the comic can you know, be translated, sorry, can be adapted into a movie, right? So whoever owns the comic rights would still by way of licensing, would still, you know, the movie company it could be a Netflix, it could be a studio, you know, could still pay and, you know, use the character licensing to make a movie from that. Same applies to video, video games as well. And they make substantial revenue from this. Um, the next is merchandising. So from the characters that have, been, from, that have been established, you know, we now, you can create a whole lot of merchandise. So from toys to, school bags to you know you you name it to so what whatever you know that's the younger generation um that it appeals to them right so these are another form of re uh, revenue that startups can leverage you know startups in this sector um also with the rise of technology and access to media uh sorry and access to media devices such as our phones tablets and um and you know our lap laptops as well you know, they are, now we've also seen a wave of digital comics where, whereby people pay and have the comics in digital um, formats now, you know, and then there are, there are a whole lot of other ways in which they, they I'll just run, run across them. You know, these are crossover storytelling, you know, like some 
maybe one, two, or three, um, um, when I say maybe local producers or maybe comics or animation can decide to cross cross tell their story by uh, merging the characters, you know, coming into the different worlds and their audiences from the, you know, their different audiences can be able to relate and even enjoy this story when um, the characters from different animation companies come together, you know, in one single story. Then um, the spin-off series is there and a whole lot of other things are there you know, things such as crowdfunding as well and collaboration. So now we we'll move to the next um, item is the challenges and risks um, that are associated for these new companies that are rising, right? So depending on the area in which you find yourself, um, there are some challenges that are expected to occur be it in, in any of these areas so the so the first one you know which we've seen from our own standpoint is the issue of infringement and piracy right so um in the creative economy especially regarding these sub sub sectors one, one of the major challenges you know uh piracy issues where people um you know engage in un unauthorized use or unauthorized production of the, these materials that have already been created and they go ahead to sell and sometimes even make greater re revenue than the original owners and the original makers. So this is also a strong issue that, um, that also needs to be addressed collectively. And it's also a major issue when it comes to intellectual property. Um, another issue is, uh, has to do with licensing and contracts. So we could understand that sometimes maybe due to um, lack of expertise in the area or not much of uh, proficiency in, in that area. I'm also referring to not, not, not just the companies now, but the lawyers that sometimes ad advise the companies in these areas. You know, they might not have full grasp of um, the, you know, like intellectual property rights and intellectual property laws. And, some, and sometimes, you know, they, they go ahead not to advise in their client's best interest, you know, either due to uh, lack of of knowledge of intellectual property rights. You know, so things that they are supposed to have a strong stance on, things like um, royalties or, you know, or creative control, which should be in the interest of the makers of this um, you know, intellectual property that are coming up. You know, they should stand strong on some of these terms, but some, sometimes due to you know, lack of knowledge, they might not um, really know how to advise on these as well. So these are, this, that's also like a challenge that is faced in that, that sector. Um, another is the, um, well, I, I will call it maybe lack of structure in, in protecting and enforcing intellectual property rights. In, enforcing intellectual property rights to the highest degree, you know, it can be a bit expensive, you know, and sometimes these smaller companies or creators, you know, they might not have the, resource, the resources to engage in the legal battle that might be, be required, you know, to, to go ahead to protect and, and enforce their rights when they notice, you know, some infringement in any way, right? Then the next stop is the changing technology platforms. You know, in this our age, with the advancement of, you know, new technologies and digital te technologies, um, it also ties into pi uh, pi piracy as well, but there are also some other challenges, you know, such as hacking, un unauthorized access, and illegal distribution. You know, these are also things that, uh, it happens and it happens at a very fast rate, you know, now in, in, in this our age and time. Um, then I would go ahead to just move straight to the, you know, things that we can do to mitigate this risk as well. You know, so um, the first is by, you know, for not, 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 not just the creators, but um, countries as well, you know, both um, African countries and um, global countries as well, they should go ahead to have a, a sort of digital rights management technology, you know, where digital media content, you know, can be marked and can be traced, you know, and also can be pro pro protected as well. You know, this would help to, um, to help us to, you know, track, maintain, monitor how intellectual property is being transferred or used, you know, legally or, or illegally as well. The companies can go ahead to also have anti-piracy uh, measures that they can put in place, you know, on their 
on their um, content as well. Then, of course, uh, these companies should also have strong legal foundation as well. You know, then when it comes to licensing and contracts, of course, it goes without saying that they should have experienced um, legal counsel to advise them on intellectual property matters, you know, both within their country and, you know, when they want to, to, to expand their operations to any country that they choose to operate in as well. And then have um, licensing agreements that are very, very detailed and suited to their interests. Then um, countries as well can also go ahead to have, you know, to enhance their IP rights protection and enforcement mechanisms, you know, so from trademarks to uh, copyright to patent registries, you know, they should go ahead to now have digital forms of protection for owners. And then for the um, changing technology platforms, some persons have been advocated that um, we can leverage blockchain technology, you know, to help in, um, you know, tracking the sales of these digital assets when they occur or even when, whenever they are transferred. Of, of course, some things such as um, cyber security measures should also be put in place as well to prevent data breaches. So um, yeah, and yeah, so so these are things that that um, you know we all can look at you know, in our in our res respective areas or respective interest in, in going ahead to protect this um, in industry. You know, especially this subsector such as comics gaming and animation industries that are still growing you know for for them to be able to grow and you know provide much needed value and entertainment that they bring to the society as well because when their ip rights are, are protected they'll be en encouraged to go ahead to produce more content you know at the end of the day so um at, at this point i would like to draw my conclusion and thank, thank everyone for the opportunity uh, before the end of the day i would share the complete version of, of my slides to, to the organizer as well. Thank you very much. Firstly, I would like to thank you, Mr. Toby Chukun, for your informative speech and sharing your valuable insights with us. Further, I would like to invite all the participants to put forth their questions to Mr. Toby Chukun, if any. Pastor, everyone. Any question, you can simply unmute yourself and speak. You know. Any questions? Kanvi, Dr. Madhavi, Dr. Agarwal, Mr. Khanna. Um, not right now, but thank you. Sure. By the way, Mr. Tobichipu, I had a question for you. Since Nigeria is right now expanding into startups a lot, I believe. So, uh, I mean, like, uh, how much time does it take on average for a Nigerian citizen to secure a patent for his or her scientific innovation? Okay. All right. So, the average time it should take, um, from from my experience, and from patents that that we filed at the patents registry um you you can you can get it you can get an acceptance of the uh patent within uh, i would say within a month or two or two months but before you get the final uh, you know confirmation which which is the uh, patent certificate you know that could take up to six six months because um it would pass through different stages at the end of the day you know, so but but to, but to get that acknowledgement of acceptance, you know, it can happen within a month or two. Yeah, then what the is the, certificate is the, come. Yeah. What is the time period to get an acceptance for a trademark? For a, a trademark, a trademark can be gotten within within two weeks. A trademark can be gotten within two weeks. That's trademark acceptance, but the trademark certificate might come, let's say, from three months and above because there's a compulsory window for um, opposition, which is usually 60 days, you know? So, yeah, so, so that's so why I would say to get the certificate three months, but to get the acceptance letter two weeks. 
Mr. Tobichuk, we have a question from Mr. Ayush Kumar in the chat box. If you can just read it. Okay. Um, what is the best startup niche we can work on to get more success with respect to Nigerian culture? Um, I, I, I feel the, the question is a, is a bit broad because I, I would want to know what your interests are or you know or what your uh, background is in terms of what what you might want to relate. Because I might answer the question. I might answer it from my own area of interest or maybe from that of some persons that I know. You know, but um, I think you can you can reach out to me so that I can get to know more about. You know what your focus is on, and and, and uh, answer appropriately. Yeah, Ayush, you can simply mail out Mr. Topic and reach out to him personally so that he can help you out. So if there are no more further questions. I would like to thank you, Mr. Topic, and request you to share your email address in the chat box so that if anyone in our audience has any questions, they can simply reach out to you. Thank you. All right. Now, moving ahead, I would like to invite Dr. Dhuvanshu Srivastava to commence her speech and share the value of your thoughts. Thank you so much for the invite. And I hope I'm audible and uh, very well audible as well so that it can be heard to other things. And before I start, a uh, special thanks to my previous two speakers, uh, Nugangu and Mikanki, uh, for pleasing out and more compliments to the entire yeah. SKA AMG group uh, because I will be very honest uh, this is something that has been very off lately been a very point for me to present but one of such platforms where even I and as I generally call myself to be uh, to be a student of IPR this wonderful platform is making me learn of what exactly is the IPR in my fellow countries and uh, believe me there is always something uh, good and something very happily to be adopted and adapted to so thank you so much to the entire team of skng for bringing up this uh, wonderful platform where we are thinking globally and um, something that the entire country is celebrating being the g20 and now being g21 itself so thanks a lot for taking those things um, just a small correction before I move on to the topic of today. Um, I still believe myself to be a student of intellectual property rights. Um, a student who has been learning each day, each second, something new in this field. And by learning, learning, learning only, it is more than 11 years being a student of intellectual property rights. I do not call myself to be a degree holder with adding few prefixes to my name and cannot ever call myself to be an expert in this field because this field has so much to offer. This field has so much to learn and this field has so much to earn as well, not only as an individual, but what even the countries prosper by producing and protecting and preserving uh, their intellectual property rights itself. So as towards, I'll move towards my topic and uh, I, for a change, have not kept any of the PowerPoint presentation because of two major reasons. Because number one, my PPT again wouldn't have been something and being the third or the last speaker generally, the idea is generally to break that shackles for what like four presenters would be there. They'll present a PowerPoint presentation. Let's do something odd, something which the novel idea of intellectual property right also says. So break the shackles and move ahead. So first of all, wonderful theme. That again uh, complements to the entire SKA ANG group um, because this is a generation of startups. And I'll start to something to which my very dear friend, today morning when I was discussing with him, he said that please, sir, start off with something that we call as the shark tanks. And I was following the shark tanks, not only that of our own country, but the US shark tank and the various other countries, which is now available. And the best question each sharks would have asked to the presenters or the startups there is your technology patented is something that you're presenting to us holds a trademark and i reminded off of my graduation days where one of my favorite teachers of intellectual property rights professor gayur alam an authority a sitting chair of mhrd and ipr at nliu bhopal plays a very important point that as law students or even as a citizen of any country we born we wake up in the morning 
with an IPR and we go to bed surrounded by IPRs itself. So to start off, I have made 10 pointers that a startup in our country would be very much easily handed over towards how the IPR setup or the intellectual property rights, as we positively called it, is surrounded or is encircled in a particular startup. Now, the benefits that the intellectual property rights can prosper to a new startup is incountable to what my fingers can do or the, the learnings or the digits that I have learned in my life. So the, the number of benefits intellectual property rights can give to a startup, both in the terms of money, that is in terms of quantity or quality, enhances that startup as well. Now, not only they provide a legal protection to the startup's innovative ideas, the products and the services, but it also helps them to secure a competitive edge in the market. Now, this very particular line, and I'll repeat, because all my IPR enthusiasts here listening to me, is that it doesn't only provide the legal protection for the startup's innovative ideas, the products, the services, but it also helps them to secure a competitive edge in market. In short, I tried to tell that a startup is nothing but a bound or a company or a compound of patents, copyrights, and trademark. Now, the some benefits that the intellectual property rights can provide, and believe me, the 10 pointers that I've tried to give out as a benefit of IPR to the startup would all be followed by an example. And the example would be something that each one of us, irrespective of our boundaries, can relate it. The first and foremost is a protection from the copycats. And the word when I'm using copycats, I mean that the one who just like a cat enters, drink the milk from my kitchen and ran away. And that is where we, all of us, whether we are propounding an IPR or protecting our own IPR or our friend's IPR, this is how we go on to. So for example, a startup has developed a unique software algorithm, which has personalized product recommendations in an e-commerce market. And the purpose of why I have used an e-commerce website, because we all are at an e-platform today, to discuss this particular thing. Also, with all my international friends and fellow IPR enthusiasts, have all seen that an e-commerce market is something that has no boundaries, like we are connected today of no boundaries. Curtsy, SKNG, again. And this is how we are protecting for obtaining of a copyright as we generally have been saying now many countries and many my fellow friends internationally have been arguing this thing and unlikely indian copyright regime protects the softwares while we have major countries who have been advocating and even protecting the softwares through patents as well but this is how a protection of a basic startup company whether it's a legal startup, whether it's a startup that we are seeing in my backyard of my city, this is how those things are been there. So if you are coming out with a software that needs a protection or you are getting into a B2B or a B2C market, with having your own website, you need to protect the algorithm that you are protecting on your website itself. That would not only ensure your limitations, but also would protect your product from being hijacked or being copied from the copycats. Second, and very important, is attracting investors and funding. And believe me, each of my friends here who has or who are planning to get into a startup regime, these two are the best words you will always want to hear. That is an investor and a funding. And believe me, as an IPR, what and how your IPR is being protected is, for example, there is a biotech company. I would take that question which was asked to my fellow friend, um, Kaniki, that how a pharmaceutical industry in that particular perspective be taken on to. So I'll give that example. And that's just a curated example after uh, listening to what uh, she so very well produced in what the country of Iran has to take it on to. So now there is a biotech startup company which is protected, uh, which is there with a patented groundbreaking medical device technology and will likely to attract more investors because they can demonstrate a higher level of protection for their innovations. Now, these investors are more inclined to invest in a startup with a secured IPR rather than a non-secured IPR. And as a startup person, I'll tell you, 
the first and foremost thing is to have a patent protection. Now, before I move the country and post the 2005 amendment, we have been protecting in the patent format both the process and the product. And that helps us to take a with a thing approach. So if you are having a startup and you have a secured IPR, believe me, the chances of your investors and your funding would always be much more and increased by all the levels. Third, and very important, is monetization through licensing. Now, each of us who have or are willing to have a startup, we always keep in mind and we always assess ourselves by the monetization power of my own product or the services that I'm trying to render through my startup. And then if I have a particular patent to be protected. Now, this example also includes the sixth type of uh, and the IPRs that we see in our own country, India, and that is a semiconductor. Now, semiconductor is itself, and believe me, when I was going through the website of the IP India, that is that website which not only helps to locate us that what all IPRs have already been awarded, but it is also an exercise which I would request to all my uh, dear startup friends that when you are planning to keep a name, which is nothing but the trademark of your own startup, please follow this exercise of what all trademarks have already been allocated. Now, this helps you with two ways. Number one, I'll give you an example of one of my very dear friends. He was planning to start a wonderful class in a very rich, dominated uh, city, which is also a capital of one of our states uh, in India, which is Patna. And he started his own coaching classes out there. He spent three lakh rupees, got the coaching by the name of Utkarsh classes and was about to inaugurate the same during the on the 26th of April 2020. Everything was far more done and dusted. On 23rd of March, we saw a lockdown, a countrywide lockdown. And as a result of which, the physical launch of those classes would not happen. And just because he was not able to register his trademark, during the lockdown, there were several such classes that popped up during the E time. As a result of which, the investment which he put towards those particular things. So a learning for each one of us through this particular example itself is that how are we going to take a particular set of the example so a semiconductor startup can license its patented technology to the larger companies in the industry, generating revenue without the need of significant production capability. So this technology can be licensed to bigger markets who have their own things and can the startup can earn multiple money even without getting into the liabilities of production as well. Licensing agreements can provide a steady income to stream for that particular startup as well. Fourth, enhance market positioning. Now, how IPR is going to help a particular startup owner to establish himself in a market itself, which is fully dominated by players who have been there for ages and for many more things. So, for example, there is this fashion tech startup which holds multiple designs for its innovative wearables. I'm again reflecting to one of, our, of the IPRs in our country that is design itself. So this not only protects their design, but also enhances their brand image as a leader in the fashion technology, helping them to build a unique market position which cannot be capitalized by others. Fifth, the defense against the lawsuits. Now, the defense against the lawsuits would also be a valid defense if you have a recognized IPR right prior to the your startup has been launched. So for example, I'll again dive back to the software example because the softwares are today are the most created examples where these lawsuits are being filed very regularly. So the entire courts in our country are with the lawsuits against these softwares things where a slight algorithm change can can come out with a different product altogether. So this software uh, startup received a patent infringement lawsuit from a larger corporation. So it was a big, bigger market or a bigger fish in the market, which was already there. And the rising startup made a software which was challenged by the bigger software, bigger company. 
Now, if the startup holds valid patents prior to the launch of this event, they can use these patents as leverage in negotiation or counter suit, making it costly for the larger productions to proceed for their lawsuits and that would come as a valid defense towards the small startup or in front of and the reason I'm the reason why I've used the word small is because the larger corporations try generally to make these startups go out of the market before they they have a launch or they are there with a market space. Sixth and very important position that comes is the collaboration and the partnerships. The collaboration and partnerships, and I'll give you why this is a very important thing for a startup, because these startups are always recognized by bigger examples or the bigger fishes in the market. And they would always try to buy. So as a person who has originated or has got this idea of startup would never like to sell. And as an entrepreneur, my idea is not only to create and to sell my product, rather than enter into collaborations and partnerships or to license my own product because I have to make my name in the market rather than giving my product to somebody else who will use it from their own trademark and not with my trade. So, for example, there is a renewable energy startup and they have developed a novel method for harnessing wind energy by securing patents for their technology they can more easily enter into partnerships or collaboration with already established players in the renewable industry who want access to their unique technology. And the reason again why I'm saying this, this would help the new startup to exist in the market with the bigger players with their own trademark and sooner or later this startup is gonna establish its own name. Seventh, the preventing employee departure with trade secrets. Now, this is a very, very important thing. And why I mentioned this again, because as in for now, our country, where majorly I have seen this change in the past decade as well, where IP has been brought to a very rampant change to what the intellectual property regime was there to prior to 2010 as well. One of a trade secret, that is, one of those forms of IPR, which is still struggling to get a recognition. But yes, they do exist in the format of a trade secret that we generally see on. Now, why we were saying why they struggle to get into a, a, a recognition is because they do not have or they are not governed by a separate legislation in our country. Itself. So a biopharmaceutical startup has valuable trade secrets related to its proprietary drug formulation. IPR and such comes the non-disclosure agreements as it was rightly mentioned by Mekaniki in her presentation as well. That's exactly the same process that we in India under our startups can be taken into that particular thing. Uh, I have got a question and I'll definitely take that thing once I'm ending with my presentation itself. So I'm hardly on my eighth point, couple of more points and then one wonderful scheme that the government of India has. I do remember the time that was allocated to me and I'll try to limit myself during the same as well. So that is a non-disclosure agreement between the employee that would help always to take that particular thing. Eighth and very important is the reason why we has emerged, India has emerged something in the past decade as the protector for their own IPRs because as I said, IPR is that particular segment or that particular area, which not only as uh, the IPR holder, I would impress myself, but how I can contribute to my country's economy. Yes, it was very well mentioned by Nugan Nugu sir, when he was mentioning in his presentation of how the Nigerian economy and other things were brought to. And this is how we as a country or, or we as an IPR holder can contribute towards a country's economy as well. Ninth and very important is enhancing the brand value and the reputation. For example, there is a food and a beverage startup which secures a trademark for a distinctive product name and a logo. This protection not only prevents others from using similar branding, but also builds brand recognition and consumer trust. 
Indian IPR regime in the high courts have been filled with such cases. I can name Burger King versus Burger Singh. I have so many things to name on that particular grounds where such global brands have been taken onto that particular thing. There is a very small city which is the center of the country, which is capital of state of Madhya Pradesh here, and that uses of M logo, which was for the McDonald's, was also taken from that particular point. And the quote, the the name or the logo used by a local restaurant out there had to change their logo as well because it was already taken from the McDonald's uh, M that we are referring on to. Last is the time to market advantage. A automobile or automotive startup has patented a new technology that improves the fuel efficiency of their own product. This patent allows them to be the first to market to this innovation and giving them a significant advantage over their competitors and thus recognizing their own IPRs. So these were the 10 major of the advantages that I tried to, out of the bulk and the mungeon of the IPR advantages that the startups can take on to. Now, before I end, I have a small, uh, the, the country or the, like India, they have come out with a scheme for facilitating the startups on intellectual property protection. And I'm referring on to SIPP. That is one particular scheme that has led not only the make in India process, but also have encouraged the young entrepreneurs to get into the market, to get into the things. And the, by this scheme, the government of India has not only reduced the patent or the trademark filing fees, but also the patent and copyright filing fees have been reduced nearly by 80% and the trademark filing fees has been reduced by 50% under this scheme. Now, this scheme comes, um, it started basically on 16th January 2016 for a period of one year, but then it was repeatedly taken on to. And the startups have to be certified as an innovative business, which has to have a minimum a certification from the interministerial board and it established by the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, DIPP, in our country. And that is where the intellectual property rights has also been taken on to. And the, if the entity's turnover for any financial year does not exceed for more than 25 crores, now I'm to 100 crores, it is amendedly taken from that particular thing. Now, to implement that particular thing, the scheme, the controller of the General Patent Trademark and Design, that is the CGPT TM, have empaneled facilitators to provide startups with the advice. And this is called as IPR Facilitation Center on IPR. Not only for that, they also help for the filing of the IPR, advice on the IPR, registration of the IPR, drafting of the patent applications and more. These facilitators also provide all possible help for the startups to provide their IP in the most affordable manner. And similar support has been also been taken across by the International Patent Protection in the Electronics and Information Technology. This is called, abbreviated as SIP EIT. And this is basically launched for a scheme to provide financial support to micro, small and medium enterprises, that is the MSMEs in our country, and the technology startups as well. The total reimbursement that the company shall not exceed 15 lakhs or the 50% of the total experiences that they have with time. And thus, by the impact of these two schemes itself has led to or for the IPR protection of major of the startups, thus not only strengthening the startup regime of our country, but also strengthening the IPR facility that a country like India has possessed. So I'm taking a pause out here. And with that, I know there are certain questions in the chat box as well. Um, I'll be happily taking it up. Um, so yeah, there is this question. Um, please elaborate the right of exclusive license to take proceedings against infringement. Um, now, this, this very question, um, as it has been asked by Lex Basilius. Uh, now, there are two perspectives and I can see this question on. First would always be a perspective of a startup as why I have been invited here to take that thing, that how startups can take that particular thing. Second would always be from the idea or from the side of the infringer. That is the defense side. First and foremost, 
Now, if an exclusive licensee, now please elaborate the right of exclusive licensee to take proceedings against the infringement. That is a person. So all my dear friends here who have joined, I'll just take a couple of uh, like a 30 second to explain what exclusive licensee is all about before we move ahead. So exclusive licensee is a person who is granted an exclusive licenses under the protection of the intellectual property right regime in our country. Now, exclusive license, as the word itself suggests, what's the major difference between an, a, a normal licensee or an exclusive licensee is that first prefix that has been attached to it. It's an exclusive person, apart from which nobody else can have or has been associated with a license. So a license given only to one person of your own particular product is termed under the exclusive license regime. Now, this is also of two types, a compulsory one, which when the government intercepts and grants somebody else onto this, we see generally in the cases where uh, pharmaceutical industries are much more being taken on to, and it's a very important drug or something that we need on to take. Now, if an exclusive licensee is there, now, before I move towards that, the small rule of common law, also the rule that we follow under the Indian Contract Act as well, that if a right has been taken away, agent or principal, both have the right to take an action and they can take all the legal actions which are present there. Now, exclusive licensee is an agent to the holder of an IPR itself. In case, for I will give you an example for patent first. So a patentee giving an exclusive license to somebody else, that an exclusive licensee, let's name him as A, the owner of the patent, the patentee, let's name it as P, P and A both can take an action against the violations. Now, there comes a small catch. Always remember, license is a form of agreement which is being signed between the owner of the IPR and the person who is taking a license over the same. And it always ends up with an agreement which is nine of all the case that it has always been in written form. Now, for what all the things the license has been given, the same rule of contract also follows in the ipso facto way of in an IPR as well. So therefore, an exclusive licensee would have only the rights which have been exclusively mentioned under the license agreement and can take an action over and above the same. Now comes a situation, for example, if a violation is or an infringement is known to the exclusive licensee, but that was not the part of the license, then the duty to inform always exists with the licensee to inform the patentee that he can or he shall take an action against that particular infringement. I hope I have answered all the possible uh, things or angles from which I have thought that particular thing as well. Yes, I forgot one particular thing. Uh, if I'm taking, I'm so sorry. Uh, if I'm taking it from the side of the infringer, like somebody, if, if I may be the infringer and I have taken, so who or who can take an action against me? The answer is pretty clear until and unless it is plain, the exclusive licensee or the patentee or both of them can jointly can take that particular thing against me as an infringement. So I oh, okay, thank you. So I just hope that I've answered the query that's there. If there's any other question, please feel free to unmute yourself and take that question as well. Any questions for Dr. Shivastava? I request the participants to kindly unmute yourselves and put forth your questions one by one. I am waiting for your question as well, sir. Well, we go. Speak just baffled me and it has answered my questions. Mm -hmm. Though I have a question, not technical. Not I'll, I'll, technical. I'll, I'll just get back to you. I have got, I guess, one question is there in the uh, chat box. Sure. Kumari, so under which type of agreement royalty is paid on the basis of sale? Uh, okay. Mining, patent, copyright, licensing. Always remember, uh, okay, this is a, just a plain thing. Being a student of IPL, you'll always remember Royalty has all to do things with copyright. Believe me for this. If you're using a term royalty, 
that would always say i have been going through the ages the match the following question of uh, all the question papers of my school days and my college days if a term royalty is there that would always match with the copyright now in case of patent that can never be termed as a royalty theek it is always termed as what all would be the benefits that can be taken on to so royalty again would go only and only if it is on the basis of a copyright that was well answered yes sir please go the question was a call so dr shwasta uh yeah my question dr shwasta was was that, that uh, how many of our is your interest into incubating startups and helping them grow uh, i'm so sorry how how i'm so can you please get back to me how far and b is your interest into helping startups incubate and so, okay i guess you have been much efforts you have been taken sir, taking for it at a university level yeah so uh, i'll be happy to tell this um, that uh, being a student of ipr again uh, i have established i guess being a law student something that i have seen in my country and my fellow friends would definitely know there is a concept called as legal aid uh, which is free legal aid the pro bono service that we generally do on to on the similar line i have not done anything else believe me and i'll be more than happy if somebody copies this ideas of mine as well i have started something called as an ipr clinic uh with my university and this is there and we are helping uh the local i am not using the term smsc because of a particular reason that i'm even helping industrialists and we start from the basic of the thing i i can i can be dead honest when i'm saying that i have helped couple of people uh, who were running um, a sweet shop to register their name for a trademark so a, a 27 year old uh, sweet shop i helped them to i and my entire team of young budding intellectual property lawyers who are still into their third years fourth years so we run these ipr clinics plus this is exactly a pro bono service we do also we try to help because through us when these people file for their things which whichever lawyer they want to approach the only fees which is mentioned under the ipr rules and this is where i would insist each one of us that when we whenever we get a chance to teach ipr to somebody please do not only teach what an ipr act for example do not teach only the patents act or the copyright act or the trademarks act please ask them to read the rules as well and the purpose of me telling to read the rules is the exact amount of fees has been mentioned not only that there has been my last assignment was with the state of madhya pradesh where i and the team on an ipr thing we helped the government to take a wonderful uh, ideology and they, we all know there was a concept of odop for those of my friends who are unaware or not able to recall it odop stands for one district one pro, uh, product now for that thing we suggested the state of madhya pradesh to expand that thing to odop gi that is one district one product one gi as a result of which 19 gi applications were filed and out of which everybody would be very happy to know seven have already been granted and within the span of six more months we would get six more so answering you sir believe me not only me but the entire clinic out here um i am presently assistant dean and the professor at uh, gd goinka university gurgaon which is located in the back of the aravalli hills and we have a valid and ongoing legal aid clinic along with it we even have an ipr clinic for the university that helps to facilitate something to watch the scheme of the government of india does so we as an educators we as an educational institution provide that facility and anyone across our country requires that help that and believe me we do not have a geographical uh, limitation of only providing it to the state of haryana or to the district of sona or to the district of gurgaon but any help required uh, i am typing my email id and my mobile number there uh plus i can also be accessed on my linkedin handle can definitely write um uh, not only that sir i am giving this opportunity or it's just an idea which just popped up 
while I was answering your question. I'm even ready to organize some physical um, workshops in the small districts where, because I know major of, and believe me, I have been a subscriber of your YouTube channel and I have access to your previous workshops as well. You people have done a brilliant job. But I guess the only place where we are missing out is that that is not being able to reach the deep dive villages where it actually should reach. And I guess together we can take that particular thing ahead as well. We can even discuss or distribute the sample forms which are available. Because today for filing of a patent application, I know law firms, they are even charging 60,000 rupees merely, which only requires 600 rupees. And I'm not against any of them. Please believe me for this. The reason why I'm trying to sell is if we are aware, for example, a right to information application, it is as simple as free. I'm talking about a 154 CRPC application, which we generally call as an FIR. The format, there isn't any. But if you want, there is a format available as in the schedule of the CRPC as well. So why can't we together, each one of us, can come together, make this country an IPR friendly country and not only friendly, but also the awareness regarding the same can be done. So count me in for any of the help, any of the facilitation, any of such workshops, conferences, talks, whatever you feel like. And do not forget this student of IPR. I am. I would repeat that statement 100 times. I have done that in past 11 years when I've been teaching my students that this is one class where you are getting a student teaching with a student. So thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Srivastava, for your insightful speech and valuable contribution. I would advise you to connect with Ms. Anjali Singh for the collaborations as you suggest. We do appreciate your expertise. Please do share your email address in the chat box so if anyone from our audience has any questions or needs further clarifications or any problem, they can reach out. Thank you. Thanks. So As we conclude tonight's session, we want to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all our esteemed panelists for the valuable contributions to the first session of Conference 2.6. Your expertise and insights have added immense value to the city. Our sincere appreciation also goes out to each and every attendee for active participation. We value your presence and engagement. We are excited to continue this conference tomorrow with the second session where we will explore the theme of impact of intellectual property laws in the emergence of standards. Do feel free to share your conference experiences by leaving a review on our Google location. We also encourage you to extend the invitation to your friends and colleagues to join the conference tomorrow. Share the conference links with them and if you are sharing your experience on LinkedIn, do not forget to tag us. Your engagement, inviting friends and sharing your insights are highly appreciated. Thank you once again, everyone, for being a part of this event. The support is greatly appreciated and together, we look forward to shaping a brighter and more innovative future. Have a great day. Keep dreaming and keep studying.